the Theater Emilio trial exposed the Puritanism of the Cosa Nostra, which believed in traditional family values. The only woman really important for the mafioso is and must be the mother of his sons. The others are all whores, observed Giovanni Falcone. If a man of honour appears to make the wrong marriage, too bad, because marriage isn't an um, essential thing in his life. If he married the wrong woman, he can keep her, just make sure he conforms to the key family values and sees that mother and children are respected and properly looked after. Otherwise, he can do what he likes, discreetly. The husband went out to refined heroin or collected money or confected bombs or carried messages and the wife stayed home and did the housework and brought up the children and had a hot meal waiting when father came home after a hard day's work killing people. She went to mass. Above all, she kept her eyes and ears and mouth shut. In return, the husband did not conspicuously fuck around. At the upper levels, marriage bonds had likely been joined for dynastic reasons, but in any case, Cosa Nostra did not believe in divorce for unhappy couples. Only death did they part, though it did often come to that. Tommaso Vecchetta's problem had been his intense and irregular sex life. However, much Cosa Nostra had needed him in times of the gravest crisis. Rochetta was still, from the organisation's point of view, too passionate and all. He lacked discipline and control. They felt in the cupola. The interesting thing about that judgement was that the events fully really vindicated it. It was a deeply emotional sense that the Corleone had betrayed a mafia ethic. He passionately believed that made Rochetta tell everything he knew to Giovanni Falcone, as well, of course, as the fact that Rini had a dozen of Bruschetta's near relatives killed in rapid succession because they were Bruschetta's near relatives. Bruschetta was never a pendito, but he saw it. The spokesman for the mafia culture that had been annihilated by the barbarism of Corleonesi. The difficulty of being a mafia wife was suddened up at the sad fate of Vincenzia Bagarella and the intertwined story of her brother, Pino Marchens. She was the wife of Leonluca Bagarella, who was Rini's brother-in-law. For the two years between Rini's arrest, 1993, and his own, the effective head was Cosa Nostra. Vincenzia Marchesi was married to Bagarella in 1992, in a quiet and tender moment in a month after the assassination of Lima, in a month before the massacre of Falcon, and his wife and three of his escort. The marriage was ill-viewed from the start by the women of the Corleone because the bride was from Palermo and from the bleak hill town of Corleone Palermo was seen as a seething pit of corruption. Bagarella's spinster sisters sat doing their embroidery in the winter house and denouncing the bride as a city hall in the words recorded by the Carbonari. Rina himself opposed the marriage on the more concrete grounds. Vincenzio was from the Palermo family he'd used and destroyed. After the marriage, Rina was to say, the brother of Pino Vincenzo was in his heart. It should have been ruined. Pino had driven the getaway car, the bungled Christmas massacre in Bulgaria, and as a clumsy teenage picchiotto, had left his bloody fingerprints on it. They'd been identified by the Professor of Forensic Medicine at Palermo University. The Professor had rejected a suggestion that he modified his evidence and had to be killed. For Rina, Pino had in 1989 smashed in the skull of his own sleeping boss in the Chiedondo with a cast iron frying pan. When Rina then let him rot in jail, Pino became a pentito. He told the magistrates why Salvo Lima had been killed. Lima had been given more very strict orders to fix the Maxit trial. They told him, stick to your promise or we'll kill you and your family. Even Pino's love life had been destroyed by Cosa Nostra, which brought the family values to bear on a matter that didn't even involve him directly. The father of the girl Pino wanted to marry had divorced his wife to live with another, and this would have made Pino's marriage dishonourable. The stain could be removed if Pino killed her father before he married the girl. The brother-in-law, Bagarella, and his own brother said, adding that, they'd do it themselves if he didn't. For Pino, the only way was to break off the engagement with the girl I loved, pretending I am no longer cared for her. 
this decision naturally was very painful in my relationship with my brother and with Bagarella. Um, and uh, so. good from the start, was especially with hostility by her husband's family. And she was, uh, must have been in an unbearable position with her brother to be less than six months into her marriage. Inside an elegant city flat, silent, invisible, alone, hated as a traitor's sister, Vincenzio must have felt crushed. Rina's arrest and her husband's growing power would have intensified the pressures. And when Bulgaria himself was seized in 1995, the police, who burst into the apartment, found a saucepan of tripe simmering on the stove. Fifty designer shirts, Bagarella's wardrobe, Vincenzina's clothes, and a bunch of fresh flowers in front of the photo of Vincenza. Vincenzina. But no Vincenzina. They found that Bagarella was wearing her wedding ring around his neck, and in a jewel box in the flat, they found a note scribbled on exercise paper. All forgiven, my dears. My husband deserves a statue of gold. Hugs and kisses for everyone. Luca, the fault's all mine. Forgive me. I didn't want kisses, kisses. Vincenzia was dead, and this was her suicide note. She hanged herself in the flat. Pentiti said later. They dressed and combed her body, then walked it out of the apartment block into central Palermo, where it disappeared. The magistrates thought for a long time that Bagarella had killed her. Vincenzina had no choice. Such was family life in Cosa Nostra. From the look of a wedding day photo, there was pale, unhappy, puffy-eyed. She knew what she was getting into when she married the ambitious killer, always at Nina's shoulders, eager to take his place. Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino felt for the troubles of the Pentiti. They dealt with, respected Mafia values, and understood that turning against Cosa Nostra was not mere expediency. Men of Honor had begun to turn in the 80s because of the primitive and ferocious mafia ethic was breaking down. Ordinary life began to offer, even in Sicily, something more than the rewards of blind clan loyalty. The colossal wealth brought by the drug trade brought no improvement to the lives of those who risked their necks for it. The creative enjoyment of a fast car or a gold Rolex or expensive clothes was cold comfort for a life of whole hiding sexual misery, mistrust and constant fear of betrayal and death. The old Mafia reward hadn't been wealth but power. Giving orders is better than being, was an often heard Mafia saying. Francesco Marino Manioni told the magistrate, Roberto Scappinato, a lot of people think you joined the Cosa Nostra for the money. You know why I became a man of honour? Because, before in Palermo, I was Mr Nobody. Afterwards, wherever I went, people bowed. Their heads. No money could have got me back. The choice, wrote the sociologist René Sibat, who came from Frankfurt School, was now between Eros and Thanatos, the contrary impulses of love and death, and the long self explainings of such complex and intelligent entity as Bachetta and Antonio Calderon. What struck you were the claims of feeling. It was one thing to be a member of Cosa Nostra as a man could, and another be a woman who shared the deadly ethos and the anguish, but not the limited autonomy of the man. Outside the Mafia, people like Letitia Baggi might repudiate the old subordinate roles they inherited. For a woman inside that world, it was a lot harder. It was Shubia who told me about Rita Atria. In the morning I met Shelby, she was sitting in the sun in the village of Scopello, and the sun flashed off her dense, long, golden hair, as it did off the sea in the bay of Castellino, below us. Shoba had a fat black leather-bound diary with thousands of names and addresses and telephone numbers in it. It had fallen into the sea at some point, now it was dry again, but most of the numbers were illegible. We made an appointment to meet in the bar Rooney a few days later. It's one of the key meeting places in Canada, and a place to observe the interplay of senile aristocracy, mafia of the second level, the business level, the wannabes. Shubba, by weird chance, was one of Letitia's marvellous daughters, and she too turned out to be a photographer. She'd been to India, where she'd taken a Hindu name and a Hindu religion. She'd been in Cuba and done a reportage on Che Guevara's children and Fidel's rebel daughter. 
She caught rows and rows of Palermo aristocrats and pinned them up as photo butterflies. She did stories on the mafia and that how she met Piera Iello. People didn't normally meet Piera Iello because she was in hiding under witness protection. Piera Iello was Rita Atteria's sister-in-law. The Atrias were a mafia family from Palermo, where war was going on between two clans. The father, Vito, had been killed in 1984. His son, Nicola, grew up and dealt in drugs and said he'd avenge his father's death. Nicola had a sister, Rita, ten years younger, who adored him. He used to play with her when she was little and later, when their father had been killed and Nicola got involved in men's business and their mother forbade Rita to see him, they used to meet secretly in another town. Nicola had a girlfriend, Piera, whose family weren't mafia. She was a tough girl, though, and a tough woman later. My name is Piera Aello, and my life can be soon told. At 14, I got engaged, married at 18. I was a mother at 21 and a widow at 23. Piero was 10 years older than Rita and remembered Nicola coupling the little girl when she was six years old. Later, Piero wanted to leave Nicola and his mafia life, but I hadn't taken the honour of the Atrias into account. They forced me to marry him. She was working, though, on getting Nicola to turn when he too was shot down in front of her in the bar slash pizzeria which you've learned in town. I loved Nicola. He was the father of my daughter. My daughter mustn't ever be ashamed of being a Atria or a being Sicilian. Piera went to the magistrates. She was going to speak. The women of the mafiosi always know everything. If they speak, it'll be the ruin of Cosa Nostra. I was on the point of convincing Nicola to collaborate. A woman can take her own man where she wants even if the man is a super boss. A few months later, 17-year-old Rita decided to speak too. Together, Rita and Pietra, Piera Atria drew Paola Borsellino a map of Mafia Power in Palermo. For Rita's mother, the choice was a tragedy. Having lost her husband and her son, she was now losing her daughter to the perfidious influence, she believed, of the daughter-in-law. She called them infami. took legal action against board Salino's office for kidnapping Rita. In their desperation, she threatened Rita with what happened to her brother. Piera and Rita were taken into a hiding place in Rome. She was a young girl, very attached to her mother, a mother who never accepted the choice she'd made. Piera remembered there were angry telephone calls, furious rows that left her in a dreadful state. But it was better than the terrible fear that surrounded her in Parthenia. Rita had kept a diary there. Or in the afternoon, when I was outside, just hanging out in the washing, I saw Claudio Cantanzino go by in his car. It wasn't the first time I've seen him. Claudio lowered his head, but the other person moved over to get a look at me. Better to be a cage of hungry lions than the face of a cardos actress, hatred. I can go off into the smallest hiding hole in the world and hide there forever, but if they want to, they'll find me, and then they'll kill me. Or in the morning and I can sleep. I'm terribly afraid. This evening, it was 11.35, I heard someone knock at the door and they went on knocking insistently. It was Andrea Dana. I know he always carries a gun. This evening he wasn't drunk. He was able to do what they'd ordered him to do. Kill me and my mother. I told my mother everything was okay. I invented some excuse to claim to calm him down. But I'm afraid tomorrow they'll kill me. Piera Eilo and Rita Atria's new life in Rome. At first was almost fun, almost normal. They were sightseeing and dancing together and met other young people, but they had to keep changing house and their minders forbade them for security reasons to make lasting friendships. Rita had to allow to see a young seaman called Gabrielle, but she herself was afraid. She wasn't afraid of Gabrielle, but of his family. And what would happen when his mother discovered who she really was? Paolo Borsellino was their one link with life back home. Borsellino had a peculiar gift of intimacy, of friendship, and he stayed close to Rita and Piera long after their usefulness was exhausted and didn't leave them. His sister remembered that. Paolo used to talk about Rita with his own daughters because he thought of her as one of them and because he wanted to get a better understanding of the psychology of such a young girl. He used to call her a... Uh, a little girl.
in Sicily and was like his own daughter. He was deeply attached to her. Borsellino used to tease Rita and she used to call him Uncle Paolo. Apart from Piera, he was all the family she had known. She used to think in Rome about becoming a woman. She puzzled about it in her diary. I'd be a woman if I were really a woman. What little thing is it that makes the difference between me and a woman? Maybe that I haven't yet tried the pleasures of the flesh. I didn't realise how important that was. If that's the only difference, then take me out in a public place and lay me out on a bed and only then you'll understand how old I am. I'm younger than you can know, but I'll give you such immense pleasures that your spirit will enjoy them more than you can ever dream. If there exists an adjective greater than that woman, well, that adjective will be mine. She wrote this in 1992, in the last months of her life, on July, at the age of 17 and a week, after Paolo Borsellino and his escort were blown up in the Via d'Amelio. Rita threw herself from the balcony of a safe house in Rome. There's no one left to protect me, she wrote. She also wrote in her diary. Before you fight the Mafia, you have to examine your own conscience. And then, after you've defeated the Mafia inside you, you can fight the Mafia that exists among your friends. And the Mafia is us, and our wrong way of behaving. For a young girl who'd grown up in a Mafia family, in a Mafia town, it was too much to ask of herself that terrible summer. There were no men at Rita's funeral at Cartana, apart from the local priest and no relatives. My mother must, on no account, come to my funeral, or see me after my death, she'd written. My mother didn't want to come. She shut herself in her house, a little procession passed and pressed a pillow over her face. There were a few friends from school, a few teachers, a message of condolence from the magistrates of the district. Anti-mafia women came from Palermo and they were the ones who carried Rita's light wood coffin. The old priest, sweating in the summer heat, gave a blessing outside but refused her a church funeral because of a suicide. She was a sinner. He called her a flower uprooted by a violent cyclone chose psalms with a heavy emphasis on sin and referred vaguely in his homely to human wickedness. A year later, when the corrupted officials inside Raul Gardini was given a solemn funeral in the Venice Cathedral, Paolo Borsellino family remembered this discrimination and recalled it bitterly in the statement to the press that the priest of her town refused for a funeral. A group of the like her the love of truth and justice. Rita was buried as she'd wished, away from her father and next to her brother. The photo was fixed to the stone, and truth lives, words chosen by Pierre, engraved on it. On the day of the dead, three months later, Rita's mother came and smashed the headstone with a hammer and obliterated the photo and the words. Nobody had the right to put that picture there. Rita should be somewhere else. Four months. For months. After Rita's death, my mother had been catatonic, spoon-fed by nuns. She managed at the end, by legal action, to get Rita's body moved to the family tomb. Piera Eelo never lost her nerve. Now and then, I go back to Patana. Sure I do. I go to visit the cemetery and pray on Rita's tomb. I go with bodyguards so people can see me. Everyone sees me, but no one can come near. They can only look and I walk with my head high, like a lady. This was how Piera looked on one of the women of Patana when she came back and how she was remembered. In one of the cars, Piera Elio was sitting in the back seat alone, alone, even though she was protected by a lot of bodyguards. She was subdued by, but smiling, shyly, sad at times, not at all overcome, hidden behind her mirror shades. I saw an infinite loneliness in her, a long, lot more tragic than I ever imagined all those years ago when we used to go and have a cold beer in the hot summer evenings at her bar in Montevago. The only one that stayed open late, she used to stand behind the bar, silent but uneasy, gentle but suspicious, overwhelmed by her husband's boisterousness. <coughs> the woman had a message for Piera. Remember, you're not alone. One woman who'd been particularly angry about Rita's sinner's burial was Rosaria Schiaffani, and she said the same. Rita, a sinner? What sin? The sin of speaking out? We'll never leave a woman alone again. Rosaria Schiaffani knew something about speaking out and being left alone. 
She was 20 years old and two months earlier, her husband Vito had been murdered with Falcon and Mulvillo and two colleagues in the Mascarone Airport freeway of Capacci. There was a fine photo of her by Letitia, fragile and resolute, wide-mouthed, heavy-lidded eye, high cheekbone, half her face, half her face hidden in shadow. The photo reminded me of Antonello di Messina's great portrait of the Annunciata in the gallery at Palazzo Abbiatellis. Both high-cheeked faces, half in shadow, both staring directly at the viewer, the fingers of the Annunciata's right hand extended softly, commanding attention, but the gaze of both was at the same time somehow inward and unreachable. The funeral for Falcon and his wife, Francesca Morvino, and uh, three of his escort was held on a rainy day in 1992, May, in the church of San Domenico. The horror of those deaths and the sense of a terrible loss, betrayal by the state, charged the funeral with a peculiar intensity which was screwed into its highest when Schiaffano stood and spoke to the authorities of Italy who rushed south to render homage. People have never forgotten the moment, the young widow of a Sicilian policeman, a delicate and implacable woman in black, ordered the country's leaders to their knees. She spoke about her dead husband more to herself than the mourners cried in the church. He was so beautiful, she said. He had such beautiful legs. She spoke some further words she prepared with a priest's help in the emotion of the moment. They came out loud and clear, but in fragments. My Victor Schiaffani, the state, the state, why? Our mafiosi still inside the state. I pardon you, but get down on your knees. But they don't want to change. They, they, don't, they don't change. <laughs>